Welcome everyone to a new term of the Friday Light Informal Research Talks. Um, so this is a, a series that we put on to showcase a variety of research going on at Grenfell campus um, and sometimes in other places. And the idea is that the research will be presented in a way that it will be interesting and understandable to um, the general public and and people from other fields. Uh, so that's sort of the uh, light and informal part of the acronym. Uh, my name is, is Garrett Richards, and there are two other people on the FLIRT committee, Jennifer Buxton and Daniel Nadalny. And uh, we are also supported by the research and engagement offices here at Grenfell. We also uh, highlight from week to week, sometimes we do an engaged research presentation where there are also partners who are presenting. So uh, today our speaker is Ivan Savic, who is an instructor in political science with the Environment and Sustainability Program here at Grenfell. So I'm going to turn it over to him um, and also uh, and remind everybody that I actually, um, in a horrible twist of fate, I have to leave at uh, at one. So so Jen is going to facilitate the questions, even though I've done the introduction. So I'll let uh, Yvonne take over from this point. Thanks everyone for being here. You're muted, Yvonne. Okay, just a second. Uh, trying to share my PowerPoint slides here. Be able to, yeah, just the same as before to share PowerPoint. Yeah, uh, just a second because it's uh, for some reason my slides aren't coming up. So let me just try something. Oh, okay. Okay. Of course, the pro of doing these virtual ones is that we can record and stream them, but the con is that the tactical aspect has a few extra layers. Yes. Okay. I think it should work now. Okay, here it is. Great. Perfect. That's yes, we can see that. Perfect. Okay, so um, there's obviously a lot of material that can be covered here. And um, I was actually originally hoping to do sort of a follow up on this because I gave a talk on the election. And uh, I do have some stuff to talk about the election itself. But um, I'm going to largely go over that very quickly now uh, and focus on, you know, the actual capital insurrection or riot or putsch. Uh, and I'll even talk a little bit about why the different names matter. And then uh, I'll also focus on the consequences. Uh, but if anybody's interested, I'll, I'll be happy to go over uh, in more detail about the election or any other aspect of this talk. Right. So first, in terms of the election. So in 2016, uh, Trump won, uh, basically losing the popular vote, um, uh, but gaining basically the um, uh, uh, winning the Electoral College. This is the, I, th I think it was the fourth or fifth time that this has happened in U.S. history, um, which has also led some people to question why the U.S. should have an Electoral College and for other people to say it's essential for U.S. democracy or uh, the, the term that's often used that the U.S. is a republic, not a democracy, so that's why the college is important and so on. Um, and in terms of electoral votes, this time, basically, bump, uh, Biden managed to um, reverse, sort of flip the results on Trump, uh, getting 306, which is the same number of electoral votes Trump got last time, although technically Trump didn't get get all of those votes because there were a couple of faithless electors, people who voted for somebody else um, rather than Trump. I think it was, uh, it's not here on this map, but anyway. And uh, turnout was higher this time. Uh, uh, Biden got the popular vote, basically um, some uh, um, 7 billion more votes uh, than Trump. It wasn't the kind of landslide that um, the polls were sort of indicating. Uh, 
but it did follow the sort of general trend of the polls. And that's something we can talk about more. So one of the things is explaining the outcome, which we can go into more detail. Um, so we can look at things, economic unease, the role of racism, disillusionment with the political system, as well as polarization. And one thing we have to keep in mind is that this, there's a complex interaction between these things. And there are certain narratives that come out that, you know, um, Trump supporters are primarily white working class. And yeah, that's his base. But a lot of, especially the more active um, uh, Trump advocates are from more affluent groups. And that's actually one of the factors in the sort of insurrection that happened. Um, so that's something we can go, come back to if anybody's interested. Same thing with the polls. They were off again. We had this sort of similar situation where the polls roughly indicated where the election was going to go, but they were more dramatic um, than the actual results. So last time it seemed like uh, Hillary would have a relatively uh, um, clear victory. Uh, Biden seemed to be ready to do a lot of, uh, to do much better than he did, but he actually ended up doing uh, quite well, um, you know, under the circumstances of everything. But again, we can leave that. Uh, what I do want to talk about is the insurrection itself and the question of uh, political violence and democracy, as well as in the U.S. specifically. So uh, leading up to the election, there were incidents of violence. Uh, the most notable one was the uh, planned uh, kidnapping of the governor of Michigan. Uh, the plan was to kidnap her, um, take her to Wisconsin for trial. Although how that was supposed to work in a legal framework, you know, um, nobody has the right, not even the police has the right to kidnap somebody and just take them to trial. There are processes, obviously, and so on. And a lot of people were expecting some level of violence. Um, I was one of them. But it wasn't the kind of violence we actually saw. I was expecting something more along the lines of these um, uh, um what we saw, right? So something like um, armed protesters, uh, people intimidating voters at polling stations, which actually there's a history of in the United States, um, which, of course, in most cases, it isn't violence per se, but it's sort of the perceived threat of violence. Um, there weren't that many cases of this this time. There was one case of uh, a New York cop uh, parking his patrol car at a polling station and, you know, using his loudspeaker to say vote Trump and so on. Uh, but none of these were sort of very significant. However, um, I wasn't, and I think very few people expected this kind of insurrection would happen. And um, it's important to take a moment and actually discuss what happened, especially since there's a lot of debate or a lot of discussion on, you know, what this is and how to characterize it, right? So an insurrection is basically an armed uprising. There are various, you know, um, the, it has a very old entomology. And in fact, uh, in the 19th century, for example, in Austria-Hungary, it was used to describe uh, basically the, the broadest um, uh, um, military militia uh, available to the governed. So basically um, all able-bodied people under arms to defend the nation. Uh, more modernly, it's sort of used as basically uh, an attack on the government, right? Riot is a little bit of a misleading term here because this, while it was a riot, it wasn't, it, this sort of implies a kind of spontaneity and almost basically a lack of leadership, right? Which isn't exactly how it happened. In fact, um, one of the reasons why it's actually so shocking and uh, such a basically break from U.S. history, as I'll discuss in a moment, is that basically this was a case of uh, one political leader uh, using his supporters as a way of uh, intimidating um, uh, uh, political institutions, right? And that's actually a very uh, serious line that usually hasn't been crossed in U.S. Uh, politics. Some people have also called it a putsch. Um, this has slightly different connotations. Usually a putsch involves uh, very often 
uh, other political institutions coming and uh, basically attacking the government. So basically, uh, most often uh, the military, uh, perhaps police forces or um, uh, quasi-governmental organizations like uh, uh, militias that are attached to political parties and so on. So the closest I think um, this incident actually fits is the definition of an insurrection, right? However, there is also this question about um, not so much the direct involvement of uh, military and police institutions, but in essence, their, uh, if we're being generous, downplaying of the dangers and if we're being a little more um, uh, sort of um, uh, cynical, uh, assuming that basically they, um, they just look the other way, right? Now, of course, it's a little more complicated than that. And, like everything else I've said, I'll go into more detail soon, right? Now, in terms of violence and democracy, right? Uh, violence is very dangerous to a democracy because one of the most important elements of a democracy and what actually helps it keep going is that there's this uh, expectation of um, that basically by playing by the rules, you have a chance to uh, either be in power or come back to power, and you have a way of, even in opposition, influencing the direction of the government. You don't have this fear of retaliation. And um, trust is seen from sort of a less institutional and more of a, a, a normative uh, in, uh, aspect of democracy seen as very important, right? Uh, trusting that basically those in power will basically st stay by the rules and not use their power against their opponents, right? Uh, this, in essence, and for a large part, this has been true of U.S. democracy. There have been violence and intimidation, uh, usually against marginalized groups. Um, and, of course, this isn't to dismiss it, but basically all democracies have had sort of darker periods in history, and as they evolve over time, and we could actually go through a number of democratic institutions and point out the um, shortcomings and violence used by the state to basically limit democratic freedoms, right? But this is important because um, it's sort of a break with this, right? And in essence, it's a break with an important democratic tradition, which is which is referred in political science as the democratic moment. And I'll talk about that uh, in the next slide. But I do want to point out uh, a couple of things, right? Uh, first of all, this kind of violence in the democracy tends to favor the right rather than the left. And the reason for this is that uh, military and police institutions tend to have, tend to be more favorable towards um, uh, right-wing positions, right? Um, and this doesn't mean that police forces and militaries are inherently undemocratic. But um, they do tend to basically, you know, the old saying in, in political science and in, in, you know, studying bureaucracies and political institutions is that, you know, you stand where you sit. So there's a selection effect and also uh, in terms of institutional effects that tend to basically put these kinds of institutions more in favor of the right. This helps in part explain uh, the outcome, right, in that... Um, Many of, uh, you know, police, uh, the leadership was, is more sympathetic towards right-wing protesters versus left-wing protesters. Um, there's actually a, a joke that came out after the Capitol right is why, um, why, the Capitol, why the police didn't respond quickly enough, and that's because uh, they had to go home and change, right? And this is a bit unfair because, of course, there were a, lot of, a number of Capitol Police officers who actually did their duty and actually risked their lives to help protect um, Congress and minimize the impact of violence. And this is important because um, a lot of people don't fully realize how close this got to being um, uh, violent. The protesters basically stormed Congress about two or three minutes before the full evacuation, right? One police officer who uh, led riders away actually uh, led, led them away from an open door that would have led to uh, where some Congress people were sheltered, right? But this is contrasted with some other police officers who basically 
um, you know, opened uh, gates for protesters who basically interacted with them, had selfies and so on. Um, and then the question that has also been raised, and of course, one of the things that some people in the movement um, uh, is this question about whether this could lead to a second civil war, right? Uh, the most likely answer, just to sort of head it off, is that it most likely won't. And there are a number of reasons for that. But the overall effect of this can actually have a very negative and coercive effect on, on democracy in the U.S. So I talked about this democratic movement. And this is the idea that the real test of a democracy, right, is not so much its institutions or kind of constitution it has or whether it holds election. A country really becomes a democracy the first time the um, party in power uh, that loses an election leaves power and gives everything uh, to its replacement, right? And this is important because, you know, and a lot of early, uh, young democracies, you know, when a political party is elected to power, they love democracy and so on. But it's a question of when they leave power, that's when the danger is the highest, right? And one thing that can be said about uh, the U.S. as a democracy is that while it hasn't been perfect, and there are a number of ways we can see the sort of limitations and undemocratic elements of U.S. democracy over time, it has had a long tradition of the democratic moment, right? Starting with things like uh, George Washington refusing to go for a third term, um, the contested elections not leading to violence, uh, and there's some uh, there are a number of examples we can point to. So, for example, the more, most recent one is Bush v. Gore, right? So in 2000, um, when uh, Gore challenged um, the results of the election, and um, it came down to a Supreme Court decision, and Gore wasn't happy without, with the outcome, and theoretically, he had grounds to challenge it uh, more, but he decided to concede for the sake of uh, democracy, right? And there are other examples as well. So for for example, um, the election between um, uh, Kennedy and um, Nixon, uh, there were some irregularities and so on, and Nixon could have challenged the election, but he never did, right? Um, there are two incidents in U.S. history where this democratic movement, um, in essence, didn't really work as it should have, right? Probably the most famous one, one I haven't actually put on this slide, is um, the U.S. Civil War, right? And in this case, basically, the election of um, uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, led to secession first in North Carolina. And um, it's actually interesting that this secession happened very quickly. And even before Lincoln was inaugurated, um, uh, a lot of the southern states has seceded, right? In fact, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, was sworn in um, to office a couple of days before Lincoln was sworn into office, right? Another example is Hayes versus Tilden, uh, an election in 1876. It was a very close election, and uh, in essence, there's also questions of fraud and so on. And at one point, um, uh, the, mil the head of the U.S. military even uh, suggested to Tilden that if he needed, the military was there to stand by, right? And um, uh, in this, and uh, Tilden was a Democrat from the north, from New York. Uh, actually, it's interesting. When I lived in New York, uh, I lived at the end of the street was a statue to Tilden. Um, and in essence, this led to the Compromise of 1877. So in essence, um, uh, the Republican was able to keep uh, to be elected. And as a result, um, he agreed to remove uh, the last sort of elements of Reconstruction. And this led to the domination of Southern Democrats and the introduction of uh, Jim Crow uh, into the, the Southern U.S., and so it was a period where democracy was saved, but in part by uh, removing the power of uh, the newly emancipated um, 
uh, uh, black residents of the South, right? And I also want to talk a little bit about violence and the use of violence and why a lot of people, including myself, were expecting some kind of violence. This is a graph that shows the number of terrorist attacks uh, since 9-11, right? The light blue are uh, far right wing extremists and the dark blue are radical Islamic extremists. And you can see here that in terms of number of incidents and number of people dead, um, in most years, uh, the far right has actually caused more deaths than Islamic terrorism. Um, and I can skip this. And in fact, um, despite the fact that very often in right-wing circles, there's this equation of violence with the left, um, violent incidents, again, um, for a number of measures, indicate that basically the left is much less violent uh, than the right. Now, this isn't to make a general statement about left versus right. And there are periods in time where uh, this has changed. And for instance, in the 1960s, the left was much more likely to use violence as the right, but things have changed, right? And there's this phenomenon that's been happening since the 1990s, where the number of quote unquote patriot groups tends to increase under democratic presence, right? But this has actually been made uh, uh, even worse with the growth of a number of right wing and uh, in some cases openly fascist organizations in the United States. And many of them were actually there um, at the Capitol. Right. So what are the consequences going to be of this insurrection? Now, it's very complicated to say, and um, I can only give rough outlines, right? Uh, of what seems the most likely outcome and uh, why I think that is, right? And I can give more details in the Q&A. So first of all, Biden is coming in with a number of challenges, right? First of all, there's still the COVID-19 pandemic that needs to be dealt with. Um, and of course, the U.S. is fast approaching 400,000 deaths, right? Um, in addition to this, there's need for economic recovery. The Trump administration did do some, and of course, there was a recent uh, bill introduced by Congress, um, but a lot more needs to be done. And in fact, there's indication that the, that, um, the stock market and other sort of economic indicators are doing better, partially as a result of Biden's promise to introduce um, a, a, a in package very quickly. But what's been added to, and of course, one of the things that has also been in 2020 is this idea of police violence and the need for reform, which is one of the dominant issues during the summer and arguably helped uh, Trump. So if on top of this, we also have this question about how to deal with the insurrection, right? Now, Biden is already gonna have some difficulties in terms of Congress is, um, even though Biden will end up controlling, both, uh, the Democrats will end up controlling both parties, they're relatively weak. They basically just barely have a majority in the Senate. Uh, and of course, it'll take um, a while for that to be introduced as the old Senate leaves and new one comes in. Uh, Republicans are likely to return to being deficit hawks, which means that they'll try to challenge any kind of spending programs. Um, which Biden is going to need to basically deal with the pandemic as well as the economic um, consequences. And of course, Bernie Sanders and the progressive wing of the Democratic Party have different views. And so Biden is going to have this difficult thing of trying to balance these two things. So in this, you know, 2020 was going to be a difficult uh, year. Now, if we add to this dealing with the um, insurrection, it makes things much more complicated. So first of all, the question is how to respond to this insurrection, right? Now, there has been some, uh, generally speaking, when you're dealing with extremist movements, what's necessary is to basically have a separation between the hardcore versus the more moderate elements, right? And, um, you know, a, a lot of Trump supporters basically have don't really have that negative a view of the insurrection. A lot of Republicans think that it was justifiable or, you know, it wasn't 
ideal, but it wasn't as bad. And, and there's a lot of equivalency that's been made between uh, the Black Lives Matter protests and this incident, even though, you know, it's a clear distinction of why these two things are different, right? Because the Black Lives Matter protest is a largely nonviolent movement, which has had uh, periods of violence, um, and it at, isn't directed by any, you know, uh, politician, right? Whereas this particular incident was, um, you know, this arguably the the low number of deaths, five people died, uh, which of course is still tragic, but not as bad as it could have been. Um, and on top of that, uh, this was in the most important thing is this was uh, in essence directed by Donald Trump. And so there's going to be this need to um, separate the more modern elements for the, from the more hardcore and basically trying to marginalize the hardcore. And this is the most important thing. And this is what American democracy and whether it becomes violent or more peaceful, what it really hinges on, right? Um, and of course, part of that is also going to be trying to stabilize the economy and deal with COVID, right? By solving these underlying problems, um, uh, the Biden administration will be able to sort of uh, um, uh, change the focus, right? But this also raises the question about impeachment. Now, Donald Trump has already been impeached, which means that Congress has voted to impeach him, and now this will actually go to the Senate. And the question is whether Trump will be... Um, uh, uh, Basically, will Congress um, vote? Well, will the Senate basically convict Trump uh, of the uh, of basically sedition? Right now, this is complicated, and there are a couple of issues here. First of all, we have to remember that uh, the Senate and this trial and impeachment isn't necessarily a criminal offense, right? So basically, even things that weren't wouldn't be uh, criminal offenses. Uh, could be impeachable offenses. So famously, um, uh, Bill Clinton was impeached for lying to a prosecutor basically about an issue that wasn't even the core of um, what he was being investigated for. And this was grounds for uh, impeachment. Now, uh, in the case of U.S. law, there's actually a lot of leeway that courts give to uh, political speech, right? Uh, and Legally speaking, uh, it's debated, but Trump might not, if he was a private citizen, might not face charges for inciting violence, right? But uh, it's different for a president. And so the question is, will the Senate vote? Um, it's still hard to say. The, uh, the Senate will be majority uh, Democratic, but you need sort of two-thirds majority to actually get an impeachment. There's some indication that some Republican senators might uh, uh, switch over and uh, vote to um, uh, impeach Trump. Uh, this would be a break from history. Any other period of impeachment, usually the vote broke down along party lines with the uh, possible exception of uh, Richard Nixon, where he ended up resigning because he knew that he was likely to be impeached. Um, and the question is, does this matter? This is the issue that's been raised. Like, why not just let him leave office and just leave things be? And the main reason why is because if Trump got impeached, uh, he would no longer be able to uh, go for political office. And there has been indication that he was interested in um, uh, going up for election again in 2024. Um, but uh, the other thing, too, is it's important that this would actually send an important message about what the limits are. The most dangerous part of this um, incident, uh, other than the potential violence that might happen, is the precedent that it would set. Uh, if a politician can use their supporters to put pressure on uh, another political body to basically overturn an election, this sets an incredibly uh, important precedent. Now, s some people who uh, are against impeachment have basically said, well, what we really need here is healing and reconciliation, and impeaching Trump wouldn't really do this. 
And in fact, a big proponent of this, not surprisingly, is Donald Trump himself. Uh, but there's a problem here. And in fact, there's a double-edged sword. Um, not impeaching Trump, again, sets up this precedent that if a president does something as extreme as this, uh, it can be sort of um, glossed over, right? Um, and the other thing in terms of whether this will actually happen, the bind that Republicans are in is that many would actually welcome impeachment because uh, they feel that Donald Trump has hijacked the political party and a lot of them uh, sort of fall in line with basically given how much support he has in the Republican uh, party and um, the success that the economy had before um, uh, the pandemic hit. This would be a very useful way of getting rid of Trump, but of course that doesn't mean that individual uh, senators would actually want to stick their neck out. Um, there's been sort of conflicting reports, uh, for example, from Mitch McConnell, who is currently the uh, majority leader in the Senate uh, and will be the minority leader um, uh, after the new Senate comes in, that first that he would be in support of, uh, well, that he would vote for uh, impeachment, and then he said, no, he wouldn't, and then now it's more kind of an ambiguous position. So that's the kind of problem that Republicans have. Now, the question is, what are we going to see in terms of future violence? And I think this is the last thing I want to do before I open up the questions. First of all, there's already concern. Well, there's concerns about uh, violence during the Biden inauguration. Uh, reports have been out that there are basically uh, protests planned in um, all, 50 all 50 state capitals and um, uh, uh, Washington, D.C., and that these are going to be armed protests. Now, of course, the organizers in the chatter has been that officially it's nonviolent, but there's been a lot of violent rhetoric. Uh, I think that given the situation, it is possible violence can break out. But uh, given what happened with uh, the Capitol insurrection and given uh, that, uh, you know, police forces and the National Guard and so on realize they have to take these things seriously, uh, it's less likely to, that we're going to have, we're going to see the kind of violence. Uh, this doesn't mean that it won't necessarily happen, but, you know, a lot of right-wing protesters sort of rely on uh, basically support from, uh, you know, police and so on, and they might, they might not think that they have that now. Now, I think that this would likely lead to future incidents, basically, that the inauguration, even if it ends up being smooth sailing, which is possible, uh, uh, the fact that we've seen this kind of violence increases the likelihood that it might happen again. Now, the question about whether this could lead to a civil war in the U.S., this is not impossible, but it is unlikely for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, um, civil wars don't happen they're not spontaneous outcomes, right? Uh, riots are um, and so on, but even low level violence like terrorism, terrorist attacks need organization and planning. And the groups that were involved, uh, even though they're organized, they're not organized to a level to actually have effective militias and so on. There are a large number of militias, but they're not as organized and trained as many people think they are, right? A lot of them, uh, you know, in essence, they're basically cosplaying as soldiers, right? This doesn't mean that they're not dangerous, but they don't come to the level of uh, posing a threat. The bigger danger is if um, uh, other government institutions or other forces basically start picking sides, right? And as I said, um, obviously, there are groups like the Republican Party and... Um, uh, police and military uh, officials who might be more sympathetic to, to uh, you know, Trump than others, but this doesn't come to the level of uh, basically a breakdown in um, cooperation, right? Or basically deciding to actually pick a side and, and fight. Right? Okay, I think that's where I want to end it and uh, see if there's any questions.
Thanks, Yvonne. That was awesome. I would, I always really enjoy these things because I like consume American politics. Like it's, I, I'm kind of obsessed. So I always love these, these um, talks. Um, so if anyone has any questions before I ask the multitude of questions I have, um, I'm just looking at Facebook here and I'm not seeing anything here. Does anyone on here have any questions? You can unmute yourself if you do. If not, I can start, I'll start by asking my first question. So um, you talked about like Biden's like first kind of like what he's going to be doing when he first gets um, into power in inauguration and how they're looking on the impeachment side of things. Um, has, I see Ignatius, I'll ask my question and then I'll get to Ignatius. Um, but the question I have is, so what about like, Will impeachment hurt? Because like the first hundred days is like the most important part of a new presidency. That's like where you can get the biggest, part, like your biggest bills passed. So if impeachment is taking up a bunch of that time, doesn't will that really negatively impact Biden's agenda? It might, and it depends on uh, how this is treated. So what Biden has tried to do, and he's actually been talking to Mitch McConnell about this, is to try to segregate the two issues. Right. In essence, uh, having um, putting, in essence, uh, the economic and COVID response as the sort of the key issue and then having the, the thing on the back burner. So and of course, there's no need to basically get to it that quickly. Right. So. OK, cool. And say Ignatius has a question. Um, Ignatius, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask it. From our office yeah, um, it's like I'm joining the other program, right? So I'm kind of very shortly. Uh, it's been a very exciting Hello, time. Hi, everyone. Like Good to see you. University. Yeah, I was, I was wondering. The, I, I is something, Ignatia, do you have something else on in the background? So I just we can hear some other voices. There we go. Well, and you'll hear. Is it okay now? No, I can hear like Leanna talking about are you at the grad fair. Yeah, the grad fair. I, I don't know whether if I close it, I'm going to be out. Okay. I mean, if you, you can close it and then you can go back in, I think, afterwards. Sorry, I muted, I, I, I muted you just because it was coming in back as feedback. You can unmute yourself again. Okay, so sorry for that. That's okay. There yeah. you go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what uh, I, I hear a lot of people do say that uh, the Black Lives Matter organization were, were, were organized by uh, our, pol our politicians. But I believe that uh, they could, it, it couldn't have been possible without political influence. Even though these uh, people were not known, but I believe they had their agenda, they had their plans, everything set before they had their master plan, okay, before coming out. And without the influence of politicians, it, it was going to be very difficult for them to uh, appreciate the, the political opportunity for them to make capital gains, uh, political gains out of it. So in as much as we 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 did not really see the the known the known faces from both uh, Democrats and Republicans, I believe they were solely behind it because uh, there was a conspiracy theory going around that it really benefited the vote of of Biden. That hasn't been established yet, but uh, it is also known that ba Biden was more al Biden aligned himself closer to the to the black lives matter group that is why and even is is is, is uh, appointees has really proven to that because most of his appointees have been blacks mm -hmm. okay so i i also i based on that based on that grounds i believe that even though people known faces from both political device were were not seen in the organization they were behind the scene doing their own things to uh, to the to the benefit of Biden. Well, uh, that's. I'm not sure if I agree. I mean, the the issue is that um, Black Lives Matter started as like you know uh, the organizations that were involved in the Capitol, not as basically they weren't organized by political groups, but basically to influence political groups, right? And in essence, the Black Lives Matter protest ended up, um, there was a lot of worries that it would actually hurt Biden for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, because the Democratic strategy under Biden was to try to get Trump voters and try to flip the suburbs, right? And uh, the Black Lives Matter protests are probably one of the things that has, um, uh, in essence, uh, hurt 
uh, well, basically prevented that most because from the point of view of, you know, middle class suburban voters, what they're concerned with is what, even if they're sympathetic and a lot of them are to basically the treatment of uh, African-Americans in the United States, they're much more concerned about law and order and keeping the suburbs safe and so on. Um, and uh, the problem Biden also had is that uh, he was involved in a lot of the uh, tough on crime legislation in the 90s that uh, the Black Lives Matter is sort of uh, movement is pointing, pointing against and that needs to be repealed. Trump actually tried to use this as leverage against uh, uh, Biden and try to get more of the black vote. Uh, so this is a case where uh, I think that uh, now, having said all that, Black Lives Matter was more likely to support Biden than they were Trump. Um, and so there is a sort of interaction where um, these institutions are not, uh, they're not created by politicians, but they're very often used by politicians. And of course, Biden eventually ended up uh, being able to, um, you know, get support with Black Lives Matter and so on, right? Uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. I, I really get it. I, I, I do appreciate that. But then if you say they were not created by politicians, do you mean to say partisan politicians? That is just from uh, Democrats and Republicans, because I, I believe that uh, all those who were involved, actively involved, were politicians, but just that they, they do not maybe they they they, they do not believe, uh, belongs to either the the democrats or the republicans well i mean you're right in the sense that a number of uh, activists from black lives matter and other organizations ended up getting into politics and there have been a couple who have been uh, elected and in fact that's usually what is necessary for political movements is that to be successful political movements have to um, basically influence politicians, uh, create alliances with politicians, and get political office themselves, right? Uh, so, um, you know, and there's even been even something like, um, uh, I believe that one of the uh, women who was involved in the Times Up movement, uh, or the Me Too movement, uh, also eventually became involved in politics and was elected. And so, yes, there's always this interaction between uh, groups and movement. And there's actually, and of course, it has to be said, uh, there's nothing wrong with these kinds of political alliances. This is what democracy, in essence, how it functions. Uh, the key point was the sort of line that was crossed. And of course, uh, Trump having his supporters protest um, at the Capitol, this wouldn't have been an issue, right? Um, it was really the sort of the line that was crossed where, and this is sometimes where uh, some right-wing groups in the U.S. try to excuse uh, the Washington incident by saying, well, you had uh, riots and looting at police stations with the Black Lives Movement. And there's a difference between uh, basically those, at least, you know, there's clear indication of Trump and others sort of directing or using language that led protesters to act a certain way, whereas... Um, this wasn't the case on the other side. Awesome. Um, I'm just going to move on because Darian has a question. Um, is the, she says, is the Senate vote on impeachment anonymous? And if so, would there be a chance that could change? Uh, I don't know exactly what the rules are. Usually uh, um, senators do have to indicate how they voted because it's seen as part of uh, democratic accountability. Um, and so I don't think, um, even if it was possible, and I don't know enough about the rules of the Senate to say, I think that they'd probably try to avoid an anonymous vote because, um, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories already going up. I mean, it's, it's funny that uh, you even still have some, uh, some sort of more fringe right-wing groups saying, well, this was actually really all Antifa and they weren't. Trump supporters, but you know. right, no, exactly. Um, I did have a question, another question for you, and this is about um, the politics of Biden, not about the insurrection, but Biden moving forward. So mm -hmm. Biden has these hundred days, and he has some great policies he wants to do. I know there's some voter reform, like the John Lewis voter reform bill, that there's some stuff pushing there. However, mm -hmm. 
the 50-50 split in the Senate gives um, conservative Democrats a lot of power. So I'm thinking of Joe Manchin from from South Carolina, I think, because he's yeah. one of the best well-known conservative Democrat, right? But like, will that give something like like someone like him increased power in the Senate? Uh, it's hard to say because it really depends on there's a lot of moving parts. That's that's definitely a possibility. You might also see uh, um, a breaking of ranks with some Republicans. Uh, you know, we, we had uh, Lisa Murkowski of, um, uh, I forget if she's Maine or Alaska, um, but because they from Maine, yeah. But she's actually been talking about uh, switching parties. And actually, okay. Jim Manchin was also talking about switching parties to becoming a Republican and so on. It's hard to see because uh, Joe Biden is going to get pressure from basically all sides. And the most likely thing the Republicans are going to do is um, they're probably going to challenge any kind of reform bills on elections because that tends to hurt them. And also uh, they're going to become, as I said, uh, fiscal hawks because the pattern we've had is that when there's a Democrat in the White House, then the deficit and the debt are the biggest problems on the face of the world. But as soon as a Republican comes to power, oh, that, that, that's no big yeah. if, you actually, yeah, if you look at the pattern, um, the, the high point of U.S. debt was right after World War II, right, like most countries. Then it was slowly decreasing over the years until you get to basically Reagan. And that's partially a result of Reaganomics, right, this idea that lower taxes and the economy will boom so much that everything will grow. And, um, and actually it was shrunk under Clinton uh, and then basically Bush and Trump did the same sort of, the, the younger Bush did the same thing of cutting taxes while increasing spending. And Trump has actually increased the deficit quite a bit. And the Republicans are going to use this as a way of trying to prevent action. So. Right. And I see another question from Jerry and she said, did everyone get the Epoch Times or Epic Times? And if it's like you showed up her mailbox and what were your thoughts on it? So, yeah, I got the Epoch Times and that is a very um, odd publication. It's it's basically, it's an anti-communist, uh, specifically anti uh, China, anti-communist China uh, paper. Uh, and it has been taking a lot of this sort of, if you actually looked through the paper, um, it was actually, I did, um, you know, kind of interesting to see that thing. And it basically comes down to, you know, the arguments of uh, China is really bad, communism is a big danger, and Western civilization is under threat, which is been sort of a popular sort of point. And this is actually part of the problem and, and something that's actually been hurting democratic discourse is that even as um, uh, communism and Marxism has been weakened politically, it's been raised to the specter of this great danger. You know, we even had a couple of months ago, or was it over the summer, that um, uh, somebody broke into uh, Trudeau's residence, uh, planning to confront him. And, he also believed that Trudeau was a secret globalist communist who was going to change Canada. And it's one of these weird things where somehow globalization, which arguably is, is the most logical progression of capitalism, is now a communist conspiracy. And that's the kind of thing that the Epoch Times kind of like to peddle. But yeah. Yeah, Darren also just says she read some of it and it was unsettling. <laughs> I haven't seen it, though. <laughs> yeah, in particular, there was this one article that was fascinating that talked about the need to um, return chivalry. And uh, and basically, feminism is dangerous. But the things that were actually advocating that husbands should respect their wives, listen to them. And, you know, that I don't know of any feminists who basically disagree with that. So I'm not really sure what they think feminism is, but, you know. Yes, <laughs> Darren says, yes, I read that one. Yeah. Um, my other question I had is now reflecting on the insurrection itself and the consequences. Mm -hmm. You talked about Trump's consequences and impeachment and stopping getting him running in 2024 and that some Republicans are welcoming that. 
But what about the Republicans? I'm thinking of Holly and Cruz, who, and like even like Kevin McCarthy, who's the minority leader in the in Congress, who voted to overturn Biden's election. But and they're calling for unity and peace now. And they also said lots of things that helped incite the violence. But like they're in power now. Like what about impe- how are we going to deal with how are the U.S. going to deal with them? Uh, yeah, that's a tricky question. Um, there has been some, some talk of uh, uh, censuring them. Um, and actually, there's potential for things actually being much worse. There's basically, now these are all just um, accusations at this point, and it's, it is possible that it all ends up being just empty accusations. But there's indication of some Congress people actually tweeting while they were being and basically giving, in essence, information to writers, whether this was inadvertent. I mean, um, partially the bad side of social media is that everybody likes to document everything. And so including, uh, you know, I mean, people basically were live streaming their insurrection, which, you know, first <laughs> first rule of crime is don't record your crime, right? Um and there's other indications that in the days preceding it, some Congress people were actually giving tours to people who ended up being in the insurrection, which potentially, and again, uh, this even if it's true, there's still this additional step of proving that they knew this was planned and so on. Uh, I think some level of censure should be appropriate. The danger is, the danger is actually, again, and the trick is in balancing the punishment with because if you hit too harshly, uh, and especially um, kicking somebody like Cruz and so on out of the Senate, could actually end up um, hurting, uh, you know, the basically uh, uh, increasing polarization, right? But at the same time, I think it would be also dangerous to simply pretend like nothing happened, right? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think I think those Congress, I think the Congress people and senators that did stuff should there should be something that they have to do about these things. Yeah. If, if anything, there sh- there needs to be sort of something that'll uh, uh, basically kick people out of their illusion because what's been happening, a lot of the protesters, in essence, assumed that they were going to show up and that was going to be it. Uh, part of the reason why the the thing didn't work. It wasn't as bad as it was. Is that a lot of apparently a lot of QAnon followers, when they came in, they thought that they were going to get further instructions, oh. but nothing happened. So a lot of them just milled around in the in the lobby. Um, and uh, the other thing is, a lot of people. The reason why they live tweeted and so on is because they thought that they'd be basically get nothing but support from this. A lot of them were shocked that they were arrested. Uh, and so on. There's a this sort of classic tweet. I actually, it's so funny that I'm even not sure it's not a joke, but somebody tweeted a picture of their son uh, holding a Trump flag at, standing next to a statue of Jimmy Carter and saying, you know, so proud of my son and so on. And a couple of hours later, he tweets, why is the FBI calling? <laughs> and, oh you know, it, and it's it's funny, but it also indicates the, the sort of um, idea that basically everybody is really behind them and they all just have to do a little push and it's all going to go their way. Yeah, and I think that's probably the reason why everyone is so upset with Trump because he told everyone to come, he told them to march to the Capitol, he said he was going to be there with them, and so he said all these, he told them he loved them, but no violence, so it's just like, it's that rhetoric that meant something, and like your and your examples just prove that, like they were there, like, looking for Trump, like, okay, what do we do next, and like, yeah, that's well, and, and just very quickly, uh, part of the problem is that uh, if Trump leaves office, he doesn't actually have a lot of things he can do, right? He's um, uh, he his businesses are going to be sort of hit as a result. He's losing this might change and so on. And so this most likely political career is, like you said, he wants to start his own social media app. He wants to start probably his own news service. He's probably going to continue touring every year, you know, his little rallies and so on. And um, the problem is that he can basically do a lot of rhetoric that can do a lot of damage and sort of continue this kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, you you have to sort of try to respond to that, of course, not in terms of, you know, jailing Trump or basically preventing him from speaking, but you can't just basically 
pretend that doesn't exist because that will basically just let the, the wound fester, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's like something that I had a problem with the whole time was that his like his um, press secretaries would always say, oh, what he's tweeting doesn't mean anything. I'm like, no, but what he's tweeting does mean things like this is important. It's policy he's tweeting. Like you have to take it at that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I think I have we'll have one final question. I think then we'll close it up. I, I could talk about this all day because <laughs> Garrett won't talk to me about this enough at home. <laughs> um. Now, I was going to ask about um, now looking at that rhetoric and looking at I was always like, get the I was looking at the right and some of the like words they've now co-opted is as part of this. So something like cancel culture and like peace and unity, they're like calling on these that they're using lots of this language that's been used by the left a lot in these things. And they're co-opting that. Like, do you see a benefit to doing that or are they just pretty much muddying the waters for the left in the future? Well, I, I think they're just muddying the waters. And this has sort of been a, a, a tradition of, you know, and it's very often like they, they sort of play this double game of, of um, using, you know, left ideas and not to say that, you know, there isn't, you know, the reason, but it's basically once these kind of become accepted, they start using them. And uh, the right is especially... Often do this kind of thing because it works, right? Um, now, of course, the double game is that they also sometimes pretend. So, a good example of this is uh, a lot of right wingers will call the Nazis uh, a left wing party because they had national socialist in it, right? And of course, by that same logic, um, North Korea is a democratic country because it's called a democratic, you know. But the point is the reason why that was actually used is because it was popular at the time. And very often right-wing populists will use things that are popular. Left-wing things is a way of outflanking, you know, the, the sort of famous examples. Now, uh, Bismarck wasn't a radical um, uh, right-winger. He was a very conservative right-winger. And he's the one who introduced the first old age pension scheme because he felt that if he did it, uh, he'd basically be able to outflank the socialists and, and uh, social democrats, and they wouldn't be able to win. Of course, another interesting thing is that uh, he set the um, uh, age limit at 65, and at the time, 63 was the average life expectancy. So, you know, fiscal responsibility. But um, yeah, and I think that that's, that's the kind of uh, confusion that uh, basically a lot of extremist right-wing groups um, uh, value. Right, okay. the, using left-wing rhetoric to muddy the waters, and uh, you know we've actually even seen the sort of thing like uh, a year ago the New Zealand um, mosque attack. Uh, you know, part of the rant was environmental reasons, and so environmentalism is also being co-opted by some right-wing groups as a way of you know arguing against migration and these kinds of things. So. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This was awesome. We love having you present because it's always really timely and very, very current events focused. So thanks again, and we'll have you back again. And everyone, thanks for joining us today for Flirt. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for everybody who asked questions and came to listen. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Bye.